So first of all, when we're talking about hypothesis testing, there's something called the null and the alternate hypothesis. And as I said, use the term status quo, the status quo would be what the null hypothesis is, that we're going to accept the same findings as before. And the alternate is what we're going to try to prove. So uh, in this example here, this talks about um, particulate matter in a, a car and light truck engines. And in an urban setting, they give off 35 milligrams of particulate matter per mile of travel. Now, let's say somebody comes up with a new engine design that's supposed to reduce that amount and that goes into the air. Now, there are two possible outcomes that'll happen with that new engine design. Either it works or it doesn't. And if it does work, then the new design will reduce the level of particulate matter or it won't. So these possibilities are what's called hypotheses. One of the hypotheses is called the null hypothesis. That's the one I like to call the status quo. And the other is called the alternate hypothesis, which is what we're trying to prove. Now the null hypothesis is simply stated as H sub zero. And usually in this book, especially, we use an equal sign. And if we're talking about the mean, then it would be, um, you know, the mean mu is equal to such and such, some specific value. When we get to the proportion, it would be very similar in that the proportion P is equal to some value. So the alternate hypothesis is usually given as H sub one, and there are three possible outcome. Well, three possible uh, hypotheses for an alternate hypothesis. It's what we call the left-tailed hypothesis. And that simply means when we've got a value that's less than the, the, the null, the right-tailed hypothesis is when we have a value that's more than the null. And then the two-tailed hypothesis is kind of putting both of those together. And that's where we just, um, just say it's not equal. And you can see uh, on the first one, it's mu is less than some value. And that when they have that mu sub zero, um, that's just gonna be some value put in there for the specific problem. So it was a less than sign for the right tail is a greater than sign and the two tailed is the not equal to. Now the two tail fits in exactly with the confidence intervals. In other words, those endpoints are gonna be the same values that you would um, go and retrieve the values from the, the table, like the 1.96. So you just have to be careful here because if you're dealing with a left tail and a right tail test, you got your whole, um, I'll show you in a second what I'm talking about. It's kind of hard to explain until we have a visual. But anyway, the left and the right tail test, they have, um, they're called one tail hypothesis. And if you can kind of shake it out as 95% and not 95% or 95% and 5%, then that 5% is all on one side when you're talking about the left or the right hypothesis. On a two-tail hypothesis, that 5% would be broken up and split evenly, just like the confidence interval. So here's a kind of a, an example. You got, um, I think we looked at this for the confidence interval, but you got, let's say 20, you got boxes of cereal and they're supposed to contain 20 ounces. Now an inspector thinks that the mean may, weight may be less than that for some reason, all right? Maybe he's pulled boxes off and measured them, but um, we just want to state what type of hypothesis is. The key word in here, the inspector thinks that the mean weight may be less is the key that this is what we would call a left tail test. So the null hypothesis would be mu is equal to 20. And then the alternate hypothesis, the H sub one, is mu is less than 20. So therefore, in this case, the, the, you know, there's a procedure to go through, which we'll look at in the next section. That'll uh, tell us whether to accept that alternate hypothesis or not. 
So here's one that's going to be another type. Uh, last year, the mean monthly rent for an apartment in a, a certain city was $800. A real estate agent believes that the mean rate is higher this year, higher, more than it was last year, greater than it was last year. State the appropriate null and alternate hypotheses. The null hypothesis says there is no change. So the null hypothesis is H sub zero, mu or the mean of the population is equal to 800. And the real estate agent wants to know whether the mean is higher. So that's a greater than for the alternate. So that's an example of a right tail test, a right tail test. So a third type, scores on a standardized test uh, have a mean of 70. Some modifications get made to this test and an educator believes that the mean may have changed. Now, what's key here is they don't specify whether they think the mean is greater or less than, but they just say that it's changed. And this allows both the greater than and the less to be changed. Um, and be able to test for both of them. So if, if one or the other has happened, then the, we can find that out by doing the test. So here the null hypothesis would be mu is equal to 70. In other words, it's not changed, the status quo. And then the alternate hypothesis, the H sub one is mu is not equal to 70. Not equal to 70. All right, so that's a two-tailed test, the not equal, meaning that it could be less than or it could be greater than. We're going to test for both. All right, so let's see what else we got to get into. So essentially what we're doing with a hypothesis test is we're just trying to find out how likely it is that the null hypothesis is true. Now, everything in statistics basically is probability. So that's really what it all uh, boils down to. We're going to find out how likely. Now there's a couple of ways to do this. Um, we have to have some kind of level of significance, which is what we're gonna see soon and something that's a measuring stick and just determine if we meet that criteria, okay? Now, um, this is a really neat idea because a hypothesis test is like a criminal trial. It could be like other types of trials too, but the criminal trial is the one most people are familiar with where um, if, a person is charged with a crime and they're going into the court, they're presumed innocent. And then the job of the jury or the judge is to weigh the evidence. And I believe it's called a uh, reasonable doubt. And if it's beyond a reasonable doubt, then they can change the status from innocent to guilty. Well, in this case, the innocence is the null hypothesis, the guilty is the alternate hypothesis. So there's, and if you think, well, let's just look at the, how the process goes. First of all, you assume the null hypothesis is true. You assume that your a defendant is innocent. You look at the evidence. If there's enough evidence to reject their innocence, then you do so. If there's not, then you fail to reject that and they stay innocent. So that's how it works. There's two possible outcomes, either to reject or fail to reject. Now, uh, there's a couple of different uh, things that can happen though. And that is, it may be the right decision and it may not be. Uh, one of these things that we get quite often is you'll hear about it, especially after the case, after the fact, is that someone was found guilty 
and they were not guilty. So that would be one type of error. That's an error. And then the other type of error is they're found, uh, um, they're, their innocence is kept. In other words, they're not, they, were, they were not found guilty and they were actually were guilty or they actually had committed whatever it was we were trying to prove. That's another type of error. And that's what's called type one and type two errors. Like I said, there's, there's nothing really to kind of work out here. You're just trying to deal with these concepts. And I'll try to reiterate here. All right. So that little... Um, chart down there or box this gives you all the possible things you could have when you reject the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis is actually true it's called a type 1 error so if you reject someone's innocence and they actually did not commit the crime that's a type uh, 1 error but if they actually were guilty that's a correct decision now notice there's only two correct decisions in here and there's two errors the correct decision is just a correct decision but the two different errors have different names. Now, if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, in other words, if they are actually innocent and we find that they're not guilty, then that was a correct decision. And this is the ones you hear about quite often when they're actually going on in trials, when someone's found um, innocent or they find them guilt, not guilty, and they actually, or we actually suspect that they committed the crime, then that's another type of error called a type two error. And I think that's the easiest way to kind of um, put it together is with the idea of a trial. If you kind of go back to that, it's sort of like how, um, when I deal with lower level students in algebra and number line and stuff, um, when dealing with positive and negative numbers, you tell them to think about it as money. And most people, if you do that, can catch on to it immediately. It's just when you kind of think out of it in an abstract way that it gets complicated. But essentially, the hypothesis testing is just like a trial. There's two correct outcomes and two errors that can be made. And then that's why we have something called a level of significance because the level of significance is just how accurate we want to be. All right, any questions? That's pretty much all there is to 8.1. There's not any real calculations there. Um, so, and really here in 8.2, 8.3 and 8.4, you're only calculating one thing. It's called a test statistic. And that test statistic can be used to determine um, the, essentially the probability or the likelihood that something's going to happen. All right. Now, remember in 7.1, I told you there was the three theoretical case for when you know sigma. Well, it's the same here. And this is the one that you can kind of um, go through it pretty quickly without having to think about uh, degrees of freedom and go into an, an alternate table. So if you know sigma, it's the perfect case. So let's look at one. And then this kind of sets us up for everything else to follow. Now, there's two types of testing, and they'll both have the same outcome. And uh, I was always a big fan of the critical value method, but uh, in the last few years, the p-value method is starting to invade all the textbooks, and I didn't like it at first. Then I finally understood it and realized that it's good, and I could use it to just test and show that I had made the correct decision by doing the critical value method. So what we're going to have is the same thing that we need in every other um, thing in statistics. We need a sample. So the larger the sample, the better we off, off, off we are. But um, that's why you got to use the sample size in the calculation, just as we did in Chapter 7, that little thing called the um, standard error. So that's going to be back. And like I said, is it's throughout 
statistic set value, that a standard error. So what we need is we need to have some kind of idea of how strong the disagreement can be in order to know whether something, whether to reject the null hypothesis or not. Let's look at a sample and just an example and see. All right, you got um, the college re board reported in a recent year that the mean math SAT score was 515 with a standard deviation of 116. Now, this right here comes from the people who make the test, make and give the test. They have access to everything. It's their test. They have access to the population. So therefore, that mean of 515 is mu, and they the standard deviation is the sigma, all right? But what we're particularly interested in is the sigma there. That's given us the go ahead that we're gonna just be able to calculate this thing and go to the Z table. All right, now, here's where we get start getting what we need to have to build this. But we got sigma, that's what we know there. Results of an earlier study suggest that coach students should have a mean SAT score of approximately 530. In other words, um, not everybody goes in and coaches. So uh, the, uh, the people that do get coached, they get 15 points more on that SAT score for math. Now, you got this teacher, and he runs an online coaching program, and he thinks that students that go through his program are going to do higher than that. They're going to do better than that plus 15. In other words, they're going to be 530 points or more, or more than 530 points. So then we can set up the null and the alternate like this. The null hypothesis is nothing's changed, that the mean is equal to 530. And then the alternate is, well, the mean is greater than 530. All right, so let's look at a little bit more. Now, since we got, um, you can see the little box over there of what we got. We got the null hypothesis 530, the alternate is greater than 530, and then we got that sigma. That's the thing we're carrying with us, especially of 116. Now, let's say this teacher that's given this program he takes 100 of his students. Evidently, he's, just, he's doing this with a lot of students. And he uh, gets them through this program, and he has them take the SAT. And that 100 students has a mean score of 562. This is a sample now. So that's why the, it's an X bar. It's a sample of 562. Now, this is higher than the null hypothesis of 530. But we want to find out if this is strong enough to tell us that this program actually works. So it takes, and that's why we use that standard error for one thing. We use that standard error because it takes into account the sample size. So we calculate what's called the test statistic. Now, if you remember back to 6.2, this is the exact same thing you were doing there when you're doing the z-score for a sample mean. Because you're taking the sample mean and you're subtracting it from it, the mean, and you're dividing by the standard error. So that's all it is. That's the same old thing there. It's essentially, again, just a z-score. All right, z-scores are pretty important in statistics and it takes into account that sample size of 100. Uh, so just to kind of show you, 562 minus 530 would be 32, and 32 is going to be um, um, divided by one, uh, 16 divided by 100. So that 100 is square root is 10, so that would be 11.6 divided into 32. So that's about 2.76. These scores always round off to 2. Uh, decimal places to kind of keep them 
separate from areas. When you go backwards, areas usually are four. You can go out further, but the same thing with a z-score. But when uh, and you shouldn't be able uh, in most cases. But there are in most cases the z-score and the area you should be able to tell them apart. But sometimes, if there's no whole number on the z-score, it's easy to see. Uh, I mean, they're easy to confuse. Now, um, if you kind of remember back, and I don't know how many people caught on to this, I, I mentioned it quite a few times, but when we have something that's unusual, a value that's unusual, I compared it to the um, empirical rule where you're two standard deviations away from the mean, and that means that that's 95% at two standard deviations plus two and minus two. So at that point, if you're beyond two standard deviations, you're in that unusual or rare area, okay? So I'm when I see this z-score of 2.76, that's got me thinking, hey, this is a pretty strong um, value here. That's telling me this could well be what we need to say that we're going that this guy's system works. But we don't quite do it like that. We got something called the level of significance, and the level of significance just determines where the dividing line is. Now, with 2.76, uh, it's going to it would have to be a, a pretty high significance level in order for this to um, not fly. But we'll see. So the significance level is just denoted by the letter alpha. Now alpha uh, started using that in chapter six. That's that little area that's outside, you know, when you were dealing with the, um, um, it's, it's the complement essentially, all right? When we're dealing with the sigma, it's the complement. So when we had uh, um, like that middle 95%, then the alpha gets split into two, so you have alpha uh, over two on both sides. But in here, since this is, we're talking about a one-tail test, we were talking about greater than, then the alpha is all on one side. So this is where you have to be careful. All right, so that means then whatever alpha is, that critical value is the value that essentially comes back from the table for that alpha. In other words, if you were to go and do your due diligence with 0 0.05, you're gonna come out with um, 1.645. And I'll explain that in a little bit better, how and why it's not 1.96 like you might be used to. And that's because it's a one tail, but we'll see in a second. So then that value right there is gonna be the dividing line between the white and the blue. And so if our uh, test statistic resides in the blue, then we're unusual and we're going to reject. Now, um, I've been talking about 0 0.05 because it's one of the most commonly used values and it's the mate of 0 0.95. 0 0.95 and 0 0.05 add up to be one. So you just gotta be we're um, kind of um, aware here that when we got a one tail test, the critical value is 1.645. Now let me just kind of show you why. I'll go over to that reference sheet. All right. Now, as I said, it's real easy to get confused when you're talking about a one-tail test because you remember, if you had a 95% confidence interval, then um, you used 1.96 as your uh, the value brought back from the table. But what you got to do is kind of go backwards here. If you look up at the top. See, for when we just got one tail, 
the point zero five here is in the one, two, three, the fourth column. And if you go down into that fourth column, as far as the confidence interval is concerned, it's 90%. But for just that 0 0.05 all in one tail, the critical value is 1.645. Those two are get easy to confuse, be confused. So just watch out for that. So let's just see how this works. We're going to just graph these things on here. And the critical value method is really very, is very, it's a graphical. It's just like you're looking at a number line. Now the critical value is 1.645. So if you look at this down here, the little uh, red arrow, well, the mean is the 530. And then the critical value is 1.645. Remember, this the black line will also be zero as far as the z score is concerned. So 1.645 is right there. So that establishes our boundary. If it's in the white area, if it's less than, since this is a greater than test, a, a right tail test, then we're not going to have enough evidence to reject. But if it's to the right, if it's in that blue area, and you can see, if you go to graph 2.76 there, it's definitely to the right. It's further upstream. That's at 2.76. Those are both Z scores. And since that test statistic which is what it's called, that's what you're bringing back from the sample and you're comparing it to the level of significance, critical value, then we have enough evidence to conclude that this guy's program actually works. He's getting better than 530. All right. All right, so um, let's just kind of look at this and see the possible um, differences graphically. The one we just looked at is the one in the middle. Now, it is possible to have a left tail test, and if you've got a left tail test, everything works backwards, all right? In other words, um, let's just say that that was a, a less than test that we had just done and the value was a negative 2.76. Well, if that was the case, then we would still reject because it's further to the left, all right? And then for the two-tail test, again, that's where we divide up. And so for a 95% um, or 0 0.05 level of significance, that's gonna give us those old boundaries from uh, the, um, confidence intervals, which was 1.96 and negative 1.96. And if it falls in either one of those, then we, we reject. So here's a little uh, table of the ones that are important. I mean, the most often used. 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.02, 0 0.01. And like I said, I think the reason why they use level of significance rather than going back to the confidence level idea is just because you don't want to mix up the two. Because in the case of a left and right tail test, they're handled a little bit differently because all the alpha is all on one side. All right, now, um, we still got the same old assumptions that we had before. You got to have a simple random sample, and then you got to have a large sample greater than 30, or you got to know that your population is approximately normal. And if it's not, you got to check your sample to see if it is. The first one we got is just going to be a breeze because we've got, uh, we had 100, all right? Now, let's talk a little bit about p-values. 
um, if it were kind of me, I would just uh, have the book either work with critical. I used to want to take the p-values out, but this book intermixes them in there. In other words, you know, you got questions that have A, B, and C, so they'll always ask you about the p-values. So you can't really take them out. But now um, I really realize it's probably for the better. If anything were to be taken out, you could probably take out the critical value method, but you can't do that either. All right, so the p-value method, how does that work? Well, you don't really look at it so much graphically, even though they try to do that. But the good thing about the p-value method is you uh, compare your value to that level of significance. Now, remember, that level of significance is a probability, 0 0.05 is a probability. And it's not really ne so much necessary to know this, but it's the probability of a type two error, all right? So what we're gonna do is when we do our test statistic, we take the test statistic, go look that up in the table instead of the other way around, because the the, for the critical value method, you use the 0 0.05, and go look that up in the table and bring that back and you compare those two. But with this one, instead of using the um, a 0 0.05 indirectly, you take the 2.76, look that up and that gives you a probability and you compare. All right. Now, the p-value is just the area underneath the normal curve to the right of 2.76. And you just have to be wary of this because uh, you you, you got to take into account symmetry. You remember the table and then the way that I've shown you how to use the calculator essentially deal with to the left. So when you're dealing with a to the right, you've got to take that value that comes back and subtract from one. So let's go back over here to this table. So we got to go to this one here, the big one, to do this. It's 2.76. So remember, the first one is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we need to be this one that's fourth from the uh, right. And I wish I could highlight it, but let me try something. It may let me hide if I open it up directly. I know I've done that before. Let me just check and see if it's going to let me um, highlight it if I just open it up directly. I want you to see what I'm looking at. I don't think it works that way either. I thought it did, but it doesn't look like it. Well, anyway. But anyway, uh, let's see if I can put this where you can see it. All right, 2.7 is the last one here that you can see completely across. And as I said, the way the table works, it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So then the fourth, it's fourth from the end on the right, and that's where the point 9971 is at. Now, that's a probability, but that's the probability of, of to the left, so we'd have to subtract that from the right. I'm sorry, from one, 
And if you do that, so let me show you the calculator. So what I've done here is I've just subtracted um, one point, um, I'm sorry, point nine nine seven one from one, and you see where the point zero zero two nine is. So essentially, what happens is if you get a, a probability that's greater than point five, then something's wrong. You've got to probably subtract it from one. That's what you need to do. Because like I said, is um, you'll never have anything more than 0.5 no matter where it resides because you're talking about to the left or to the right. So now uh, also let me show you, you can also do it like this with the calculator. But if you put in 2.76, see, so you, you get that same value. So the way I would like to do it is just do one minus, and I can kind of do it here on the calculator for me. Now, one of the things you can do is you can put in the negative 1.2, uh, what was it? A negative 2.76, if you understand how symmetry works, and that will give it to you directly. You can also do that with the table as well. Let me show you here. Um, so it's important, like I said, is to understand that symmetry. So if I do that like that, see, I get that uh, 0 0.028. Also, um, on that table, so if I look up the negative rather than the positive, then it kind of gives it to me right off the bat. And you can see it right up here. Negative 2.76 is the 0 0.029 up there. All right. So the negative 2.76 area and the positive 2.76 area add up to 1. And that's by design. That's a complement rule. So that's just I wanted to show you where that comes from. So now that we got that area coming back, and that area again to reiterate, it's coming from the test statistic, the value that's calculated from the sample using the um, our old friend, the uh, central limit theorem, which, like I said, is the standard error. That standard error there, and we get a z value, and then we use that z value to go to the table and bring back the area to the right. And in this case, you could almost think of it just to kind of round it off as 0 0.003. Point, that would be three thousandths. Now, that thing is less than 0 0.05. Or was it that they mentioned 0 0.05 last? I guess I'm going to type this in here. So they both have to agree, the critical value method and the p-value method. All right. Now, 
Uh, just another word about these, depending on what the significance level is, that could affect whether we reject or not. So let's just look at a couple of examples. All right. So let's say we got a p-value of 0 0.0122, and that's just a little over 1%, essentially, 0 0.0122. Now, if we were comparing to the 0 0.05 level, then we would reject because 0 0.0122 is less than 0 0.05. But if we change that level of significance and make it a, a smaller one, 0 0.01, then we would fail to reject because 0 0.0122 is greater than 0 0.01. The probability always, or the, the p-value is what it's called, it has to be less than the level of significance in order to reject the null hypothesis. So this is just a word about the relationship between uh, confidence intervals. Um, I, I, mean, I remember we had a problem that we went through with probably, probably one in the homework where um, you established the confidence interval. And um, I think it was that box of the serial thing. I'm not 100% sure. And as long, and, and, the, and the value that we were comparing to was inside of the confidence interval because it was supposed to have been like 20. And so since the confidence interval was both uh, endpoints were above 20, then we felt pretty confident that they were doing a good job and putting enough serial in there. So that's kind of the way, same idea. If it were outside of that confidence interval, then that's when we got a problem. Now let's actually do one where we got to do all the not so nice stuff. Now the good point is, we're not gonna to have to calculate the mean and standard deviation, but you can't forget that because I'm sure there's gonna be a problem in there where you gotta do that. But for this one, we're gonna play like we've got a sample of 76 students, I'm sorry, subjects, and they go on a low fat diet. After 12 months, they check the sample mean weight loss and find that it's 2.2. Now that's X bar because um, it's coming from that sample of 76. And it also has a standard deviation of 6.1. And they reiterate there too, they do it doubly. They say sample standard deviation and it's coming from a sample and then they give it as X is equal to. So they tell you three times essentially that you don't have sigma. They're giving you S. So since we don't have S, now since it's 76, we don't have to worry about normality because it's greater than 30, but we still got to deal with the T table. And that's what this little, um, a little blurb right here in the middle says, if we knew the population standard deviation, we just go to Z with that table, I'm sorry, with that t test statistic and then the, be nice and easy. But the thing is, since we don't know that, we're gonna use the sample standard deviation in the calculation, and then we're gonna to go to the T within minus degrees of freedom to compensate for it. All right, so the way the test statistics, I mean, sorry, the hypotheses are set up is um, mu is equal to zero. In other words, there's no weight loss and the mu is greater than zero, meaning that this thing diet actually has some weight loss associated with it. Now, again, the calculation is exactly the same as for when we know sigma. It's just that we're going to T because we don't know that sigma and we're doing it from the sample. So it's gonna make it less accurate. And that's why we're going to the T table because the T table essentially corrects for error. It errs on the side of caution. So once you calculate that out, 2.2 is the value we're testing. I'm sorry, that's the sample mean. 
and we're subtracting from it the value that we're testing, the, the greater than zero thing. And then we divide by the standard error and we get 3.144. That's pretty darn high. Okay, three standard deviations, and it's more than street three standard deviations, but we got to go and check it out in the table or the calculator. I'm just going to do it in a calculator here to kind of save time. All right. Now, you could do this two ways. First way is you could use the uh, critical value method um, and the 3.144. And what was the level of significance? It was 0 0.05. So again, since it's a one-tail test, that would be 1.645, same as it was in that previous problem. And then we could just um, reject like that. But what we're going to do is we're going to use the p-value method. So we got to make sure we use that right one. I don't know why. It's probably more than I understand. I'm probably some. I'm sure these people know more than I do, but I don't know why we, we need to have normal PDF and the T PDF. We always want to use CDF. And there's 75 degrees of freedom because there was. Uh, there was uh, 76 pieces of data, so we got to subtract one. Now, again, that's large, so we got to subtract from one. Now, the easier way to do it on the calculator would be to do one minus and then do the thing afterwards, because if you don't, you got to type the number in again. So, point zero zero one two. And notice that that's what they meant on uh, that they have on the problem there. <clears throat> All right, point zero zero one. If you just look at that part, that's obviously smaller because you've got an extra zero there in front of that one. So then we can conclude by the p-value method that this um, diet for 12 months, so, uh, it brings about weight loss greater than zero pounds because we're assuming that if it works, then you're going to get zero pounds. I mean, you're going to get greater than zero pounds because if it doesn't work, it means you don't lose anything. That's what the zero represented. All right, hold on one second. <clears throat> my throat's starting to go. I think, uh, yeah, I stopped it because I don't want to make it overly big, but we'll, I'll back up now and just so it'll be on here because I'm going to upload this one to the uh, YouTube thing for you. But um, if you look into the table, like I said, is sometimes you're going to be, um, just have to not deal so much with accuracy. It's just going to give you a ballpark idea, and that's fine. So notice that what this ends up being is the 3.2 is smack dab in the middle between these two probabilities up here. And remember, we're going backwards here and forwards, but those two areas are 0 0.003 for essentially and 0 0.001. Now, since both of those are less than 0 0.05, then we're fine because on both of those, you got an extra zero. So that's what you can do, but uh, let's just do one more and then we'll take a little break. All right. Now here's one, we got a small sample. I think it's, uh, uh, how many? Uh, sample of seven, I believe, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, and what this is, it's the testing for a generic drug and they're measuring it against the brand name and it's an ointment. 
Well, thanks for uh, letting me uh, know that, Elizabeth, because uh, especially when I get tired on and, and got my uh, mind focused on the material, it's hard to remember that. And like I said, I'm trying to also make sure there's not any gaps in there because it'll be longer than it needs to be. But anyway, so they're going to they're going to compare these two drugs. The benchmark is the 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 brand name. And the brand name ointment, when you rub it on your skin, delivers 3.5 micrograms per square centimeter. So what the testing is going to do, it's going to take those seven different applications of the, of the generic ointment. And then when the time comes and they give six hours, measure how much was absorbed into the skin. And that's what these seven values are. And they tell us how strong is the evidence that the mean amount absorbed differs from 3.5 micrograms. Now notice that this is a two-tail test because of that word differs or they could use is changed, but it's not specific about less than or greater than, so it's a two-tail test. And they give us a level of significance of 0 0.01, which is a pretty high one. All right, because we had a small sample, we got to just check normality. So they plot them out on this dot plot. And like I said, the dot plot works pretty good. And generally in here, I don't think they ever ask you to make any plots. So um, they usually give it to you as a histogram or a dot plot, a box plot, or maybe a QQ plot. So we got the uh, no strong skewness, no outliers, so we're going to proceed. No hypothesis is equal to 3.5. That's the status quo, or it's different from 3.5, not equal to. Now, they calculate the X bar and the S for us in, uh, in the problem on the, um, in the homework. You may have to calculate that, all right? Thankfully, though, usually on tests, that's, you don't have to worry about that. You may have to calculate a standard, standard deviation separately. <laughs> you know, when we covered standard deviation, you had to cover one. But generally, like the final exam and then the chapter four tests, um, you should have that in order to do this because it, that takes up a lot of time. But anyway, we got those, and then from those, we can calculate that test statistic. Now, um, we come with a value of negative 2.951. Again, it's the difference between the mean of the sample and the, what we're testing, the 3.5, and then divided by that standard error. And it shows to come out to negative 2.951, which seems pretty low. So I think we're going to be all right, but I'm going to do something over here. And we had six degrees of freedom. All right, and I'll show you that in a second, what I got there. Now, this is just showing you how to ballpark it using the table. And I'm going to show you the exact value from the calculator. And because we came up with a negative test statistic, we don't have to worry about the subtracting from one business, OK? So on the two tables, do they show it here? Um, now, you got to kind of realize that because of the table is limited, you can't find a negative um, T value on there. you got to go with just using it as the um, positive version of it, the absolute value. So that's why they go in there and they find 2.951. Uh, Let's see. Where am I at? Find it and then I'll show it to you. So you, the thing way you get to narrow it down is you get to go to six. All right, let me show you that.
So six is just a ways down here. So that kind of narrows us down to that one row by going to the degrees of freedom. And then so the ones that encompass uh, the 2.9 are 2.4 and 3.1. And you can kind of look up there at the top and see that our p-value should be between 0 0.025 and 0 0.01. Now, since both of those are higher than the level of significance, and I'll show you on the calculator the exact one. So I did it over here. And like I said, it's because it was a negative uh, T value, then you don't have to worry about subtracting from one. Because, but basically, it's 0 0.01. Two seven or point zero one three. It's very similar to what happened in that little section when I was showing you that when the level of significance changes, that um, it can affect whether to reject or not. Because what we're we're doing here is we are comparing that to a level of significance, what was it, of 0 0.01. Now, from the table method, because we're dealing with 0 0.01 to 0 0.025, both of those are greater. Well, I'm sorry. Then if it's between those two, then it's going to be greater than 0 0.01, so we would re reject. So we also know that from the calculator, the exact value, was 0 0.013 uh, essentially. So both of those would tell us to reject. You could also go and get your, um, and do it as a comparison on the critical value method and you would get the same results. All right. We could probably finish this proportion one and then we'll take a break. Like I said, it's chapter 11, it's pretty, as a breeze. <clears throat> I just got to have to keep my mouth like watered here. All right. Now, the only thing that's different on the proportion test is that standard error is different. Because remember, we don't have a mean or a standard deviation. All we got is a proportion. All right. So what we do is we take the difference between the calculated proportion from our sample, subtract the test value proportion, and then we divide by that standard error for the proportion, which is the square root of p hat times one minus, I'm sorry, not p hat, it's the square root of p times p, one minus p divided by n. Same assumptions as for the confidence intervals, simple random sample, 20 at least in both groups. Those two are kind of gimmies. The ones you have to be concerned about are, is the data divided into two categories? It's got to be yes or no, true, false, male, female, that type of thing. Because we're not dealing with something numeric here necessarily. And then the values of n times p and n times 1 minus p are both greater than 10. All right. So let's just look at this example. We want to test the proportion of persons willing to purchase a new phone. And like I said, we're trying to test and see if the true proportion, not just from the sample, is greater than whatever. In other, in other words, in this case, it's a co um, company wants to test whether persons are willing to buy a new phone or not, customers. In a survey of 650 customers, 268 replied yes, and 38, 382 replied no to the question if they will buy a new Samsung Galaxy. I should probably say customers. I've made this one up earlier. I mean, a couple of days ago. Now, the company believes that more than 40% of these customers will purchase a new phone. Now, how would we proceed to test this claim from the above data? And that we are asked to use 
a 0 0.05 level of significance. Now, the assumptions one, two, three are fine. Like I said, is, uh, generally the way it works in this book is you assume you've got a simple random sample and the population is at least 10 times as large as the sample. Uh, it's really hard to judge that you know, for something specific like this, because how do you know what their customer base is? But we're going to assume that. But it's divided into two categories because you got yes and no. Now, what we're going to do is that a fourth one. So the N is 650, and then the proportion that we're testing is 0.4. So if we multiply those two, we get 260. And the one minus 0.4 is going to be 0 0.6 times 650, and that gives us 390. So we got, in both cases, more than 10, so we're fine. So here's our null and our alternate hypothesis, that the proportion of the population, and that's why I made it in that fancy script. That's actually a row, but I don't think the book uses that term. But that's essentially what you're doing is you're looking at that uh, population and that's why I like to keep it consistent with Greek symbols. You know, the mu is the population parameter, the sigma is a population parameter, and so is this one. Like I said, it looks like a P, but technically it's a row. And then the alternate is the, propor uh, the proportion is greater than 0.4. All right. So the first thing we do is calculate the proportion from the sample. That's what's called p-hat, all right, because we're coming from the sample. And it comes out to 0 0.41231. Now, that's a good sign that it's more than 0 0.4, but is it good enough? Is it strong enough? Because remember, we're looking at 0 0.05. Since this is proportion, we're going to the, t uh, the, um, to the Z table. And that value that we're looking at is 0 0.1645, just like it was in the first problem. So we got to finish out with a test statistic. That actually should say Z right there. Can't fix it right now, though. That should be Z. All right. 0 0.41231 minus 0 0.4 and then divided by that whole thing. You can do that whole thing on the calculator. You just got to remember, you got to use two sets of parentheses. Use a set of parentheses up top around those and then hit divided by and then put, um, well, you can use the square root for your parentheses. Then you got to put another parentheses inside of the square root for the numerator and then for the denominator. All right, so we come out with a test value, test statistic of 0 0.6141. All right, 0 0.6141. Now, <clears throat> we can do it two different ways. The critical value method, remember, since we're talking about 0 0.6, uh, 0 uh, 0 0.05, that critical value, is 1.645 for a right tail test. For a left tail test, it would have been negative uh, 1.645. Now, in either case, it does not matter because 0 0.641 is definitely less than. All right, I'm gonna briefly do a little writing here on the board to try to do this, but. I'm generally not very good at drawing out these things, even on a regular hand. So this would be the zero. So there's a critical. Value and this would be the critical area area. <clears throat> So if the test statistic is in here, then we reject. But where is it at, though? It's probably right around here, 0 0.0645. 
four one. And a matter of fact, oops. It's um zero point. It's a whole one standard deviation less than. So that's why it's to the left of. All right. So then in this case, we would fail to reject. There's not enough evidence there that more than 40% of the customers would buy this. Now by the P math a value method, then the same thing's gonna have the same results. But if you look up in the normal table, the uh, 0 0.641, in other words, look at that, that's a Z-score. You're gonna come back, whether you use a table or technology, of a p-value that's about 0.26. Really, really high, and it's much higher than a 0 0.05. So again, we fail to reject. So in either case, there's not enough evidence to reject. All right, uh, <clears throat> like I said, I'll do something while I was thinking about it, but I don't guess I'm gonna be able to get it. Um, I was just trying to um, make that last problem into a less than. Okay. Yeah, I just remember uh, the next two classes will be review. The next class, when uh, Tuesday, I mean Thursday, will be review for the um, last test, and then next Tuesday will be uh, exam review. After that, you know. After the third, uh, next Tuesday, one week, uh, that's the last day of class, okay? All right. Uh, I was thinking I'd like to come up with a better one, a better example than that last one to make it a left tail task. But the truth of the matter is there is one in the uh, PowerPoints that's left tail. I wanted to just have another one and I couldn't find a left tail test. Uh, I couldn't think up of a good one. So I just went with the right tail test, but it would be nice to have a left tail test just for the contrast. But the PowerPoint does have a left one. I always try to bring in my own problems if possible. But anyway, that's what I was trying to do. So I just changed back because I couldn't get it to work right. Because the good thing about a left tail test is you don't have to worry about uh, doing the subtraction from one when you find the um, p-value. Okay, so um, the last thing we're gonna look at is chapter 11, which is called um, Correlation and regre regression. Regression. Now, we could kind of put that a little bit more human terms by saying correlation just means is there a relationship between two data sets? Now, everything that we've looked at so far has been one data set. So now is the first time we're going to be looking at two data sets. Now, um, all right. so let me go ahead and uh, 
scooch on down. Oh, and the last thing is here. This is just, um, oops, let me go back to the notes. Just one last thing that was on that sheet. I mean, on the, uh, the my notes. So all the p-value is, is just the area that's less than the test statistic. And then you take that p-value and compare it to your level of significance. <clears throat> you know, the critical value method is you take the, criti the, you take the level of significance and bring back a crit critical value and then compare your test statistic to the critical value. With the p-value method, you take in the um, test statistic and go in and get an area back and comparing it to your level of significance. They'll both have the same results. All right, so um, the final chapter is called Correlation and Regression. And as I said, correlation just allows us to be able to look and see if there's a relationship between two variables now. Now, the co correlation can be either a positive one or what we call a direct correlation, or it could be an indirect one or a negative. Or the possibility is there could be no correlation. Now, the first thing you can kind of look at to get an idea is a scatter plot. A scatter plot is just a visual representation of correlation of two variables. Now, you, in a sense, know how to do this because probably you probably got drilled with it beyond uh, even normal torture levels where you had to um, make a little uh, T box thing and put X and Y, and then you put them all on one line, and then you draw a line through them. Well, it's kind of that simple in one sense, but the thing is, in real life, we don't have straight lines. Now, part of what we're doing with science and mathematics is we're trying to make things conform as best as we can to these straight lines. But generally speaking, those kind of perfect things don't exist. That's why science, uh, scientists and all, you know, exist. I mean, mathemat mathematical people to make things conform to the perfect. So a scatter plot is just essentially putting a bunch of dots, and they're not all going to be on the straight line, but the idea is do they more or less have a straight line um, pattern to them? And you can kind of see on the positive correlation, you can kind of see all the blue ones. You can't draw a line through every one of those uh, dots, but more or less, you could kind of imagine a line going through there. If it was negative, then it's the opposite. Um, this has to do with rise over run, essentially. What the positive is, is a positive slope, a line that's laying from, um, or that rises from left to right is, is called a positive slope. And the other one is the negative slope, because as the uh, x value increases, the y decreases. And then if they're just all over the place, it's no correlation. Now, mathematically, you can get more precise. And what the book gives us is this formula. And we're going to go through it with a very small data set just to see how it works. But it's if you got a calculator or Excel or something like that, it's really very easy to do. All right. Now, this looks mean, but it's really not because these things you know about. Now, uh, if you look past the summation sign, which is that big sigma thing, you've got two things in parentheses. parentheses. Well, what these things are, those are just z-scores. Now, since you're dealing with both an x and a y column of data or row of data, then what you're essentially doing is you're finding the z-score of every piece of data, and you're multiplying them together and then you're summing them all up and the last thing you're doing is multiplying by that one over n minus one which is just a um the the mathematically correct say way to say you're dividing by n minus one which is degrees of freedom 
Now, when you come out with this thing, it's, um, they call it R or correlation coefficient. That's what it is. I don't know why or, and it's not C, but we're not going to worry about that because I don't have a good answer for you. But that value, <clears throat> if it's ca calculated correctly, will always be between one and negative one. The closer it is to the two endpoints, the stronger of a correlation it is. If it's a positive one or close to positive one, then it's a positive correlation, meaning that it will have a positive slope. And if it's close to negative one, it's gonna have a negative slope. Now, the closer it is to zero, that means no correlation. Generally for this book, 0.5 and negative 0.5 are the cutoff. So if it's greater than 0.5, then we'll consider that starting to be strong. And if it's less than negative 0.5. So anything in between negative 0.5 and 0.5, we would consider weak. All right, so here's an example. We've got um, this realtor that's got a table for, uh, I think, what is it, eight houses that sold in the Denver area. And it's got the square footage and the price that they sold for in thousands of dollars. In other words, you got to add three zeros to all the numbers on the right there because 400 means 400,000, 426 means 426,000, and so forth. All right, so if you create a dot plot, in other words, if you have eight different ordered pairs there, is that how many it was? It was eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, this is what it looks like. And obviously, you can't draw a line through that. You could get uh, imaginative and try to connect the dots, but that's not what we want to do here. All right, we want to find, because we're getting into things here that are only linear. There is correlation where you can um, deal with things that are, uh, I guess you would say, um, curved, but we're not going to deal with that. Everything here is going to be linear. In other words, we're looking for the line that best fits through that. But as you can kind of see from that scatter plot, um, that's not too far off from being a line. You can imagine that as you go along on the uh, square footage that the price goes up. So that scatter plot is the first step to help us decide if there is a correlation or a strong enough correlation. <clears throat> now, as I said is you can have positive and negative correlation. So in this case, um, as the red line goes to the right, the um, red line is going up because it's a rise as you're going along on the x-axis. X gets, uh, as the x gets higher, y gets higher. Now, kind of going back to this, what does this all mean? Well, as I said, that's really just a standard deviation for each one of the values. Now, in order to um, in order to do this, we're not gonna uh, I'm not gonna go through and but we need to have what's inside of this formula first of all. In our first little. Um, part here after the summation symbol, you got X bar and S of X. What that means is that's the mean of those eight data values and the standard deviation of those values. And what the other one is, it's just now they're using Y, meaning the Y bar. So it's for it's the mean for the Y data and the standard deviation. So we're gonna have those calculated for us rather than having to do it, because that would take us a while. All right, so we got four values going in. Now, so this is just a brief uh, layout of what's going on. In other words, 
if we take the x value of 2521 and subtract the mean of 2891.25 and divide by that standard deviation, we would get the negative 1.3738, blah, 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 blah. They go way out on this. <clears throat> if we would do the same thing for the y, we would subtract the mean of 447 and divide by 29.68405, we would get negative 1.5. Now, all of those are standard deviations for each piece of data. Same old standard deviation you've been dealing with since chapter three. Now, the next step is what's happening is you're multiplying all those together. All right, so that last column is multiplying them all together and to get the sum, we just add them up. So if you add up this last column, that's 6.30412 and it's divided by the, uh, the degrees of freedom. So that's eight minus one, seven. Now, here's the value we get. We get 0 0.900591. That's pretty close to being a positive one. It's about nine tenths of the way of being there. And as I've uh, tried to use this uh, before, if you've got nine tenths of something, you got pretty much all of it, especially if you've got 95, as I was talking about the two standard deviation. But this is just talking about the correlation coefficient. And 0.9 is pretty far out there. So this is pretty strong. Like I said, anything over 0.5 would be considered strong. This is really strong because it's 0.9. You know, we'll almost never have anything that's exactly one, but that would be a perfect positive correlation. So that means we can, when we determine from the scatter plot that we got a good correlation, then we move up to the correlation coefficient and we see that it's pretty strong numerically because that's kind of the, um, the, the scatter plot is just kind of eyeballing it. This tells us for sure that this is strong. Now, once we do that, <clears throat> we can create an equation now that best fits that line. Now, the regression equation is just a line that is gonna fit that as best as we can. It's not gonna go through all points. It may not even go through any of the points. Now, as I put here, um, most people remember this thing. Well, that's what we're going to be using. That's the, the general equation for a line. And like I said, everything in here is linear. So we're not going to get into uh, anything else. All right, so um, what that essentially means is we got to find an M and a B for this. And um, that's essentially the M is the slope and the B is the Y intercept. Now, uh, <clears throat> the problem with most statistics books is they don't keep it that simple and use that same format. They got to give you some other letters and I don't know why they don't. So uh, we can't really, um, harp on that, but let's figure out what that best fit line is. <clears throat> now here's two extremes. On the left is actually the, uh, the best fit line. They've already kind of plotted it on there for us. They haven't told us how we got it, but we're gonna see that. And then on the left, uh, right is one that doesn't fit very good. Well, how do we know whether it fits very good or very well? Because we, in order to have that best fit, we're trying to minimize the distance to every one of those points. Not just one point, 
but all of them together. So if you look at these two, and you see the red little steps, and you can kind of imagine that those are steps. Which one minimizes the number of steps you have to take from the line overall? Well, hopefully you would see that it's the one from the left. <clears throat> Even though that one up at the top right has quite a way to go going down, most all of the other ones are pretty short. But that's what the least square, and this is what it's called, the least squares regression line is. This is what it does. It takes the minimum and, and um, of, of all the distances together from the line to the points. Now, as I said, is they have to kind of, um, the book always, books always have to do this. They have to use something completely different as far as terms. Because remember, this is from a sample. So we're not going to use Y, we're going to use Y hat, okay? Y is the thing in a perfect world that we're dealing with. The Y bar is coming from this sample. Now and again, they use a little bit different symbols. So, um, and this is what kind of, they use A and B. And the reason why I think is that, um, rather than M and B, like I said, is what makes it even more crippled is the fact that they're using B to be your slope and not your y-intercept here. So B is easily found now by taking that correlation coefficient, that R, and multiplying it by the relation, the, the ratio between the standard deviation of Y over the standard deviation of X. And once we got that, we can just take that slope, that's what that is, multiply it times the X bar and then subtract it from the Y bar and that gives us our Y intercept. <clears throat> so now, once we got that equation with an X is the input, our M is found out and our Y intercept is found out, we put an X in there, we can get out a Y value. So let's go through now and create that line. Remember, we already figured out the R. The R was 0.9005918. And then we had these other four values. We're going to use those again. So remember, the slope, and they call it B here, or B sub 1, is equal to R, so 0 0.9005918 times the ratio of, it's um, standard deviation of Y over standard deviation of X. So it's these two in the middle. And you crunch that numbers and it comes out to 0 0.09919796, very close to 0 0.1 or 1 tenth. So that's the slope. And what that tenth means is every um, movement of one on the x-intercept, you're going to, um, I'm sorry, every movement of 10 on the x-intercept is going to bring you up one on y. Now, the y-intercept is just going to be calculated from these two things. Well, actually, from this thing that we just calculated, the a slope, and we're going to multiply it times the y x intercept, the x mean, the mean of x, x bar, and then we're going to subtract that from y bar. So here's the slope times x bar subtracted from y bar gives us 160.1939. In other words, that's where it crosses the y intercept at. So at zero, at a zero square footage, that's where, where kind of the starting point is. But like I said, is then we can just fill in the blanks. And of course, the two also, they, I don't know why, they got to switch it around. It's, they don't put y, bar, uh, y is equal to, they don't put the slope first, they put the y intercept first. But it doesn't matter for mathematics because of the, um, 
the commutative property. So y bar is equal to 160.1939, the y-intercept, plus 0.0992x. They rounded that one off. That was the slope. So now, once you got that equation, it's real easy. And I'm going to show you on the, some stuff on the calculator in a bit. So you, said you don't have to go through all this. Now, what can this be used for? Well, it's called predicted value. Let's just say that um, a person that wants to set the price for a house, a realtor, and they have no idea, well, they can just find out the square footage, plug it into this equation, and perhaps they would have something they don't even see the equation. They have an app that's been programmed to do that. And so they would have an input of the square foot, and then it would come out with a starting selling price. And they might adjust it to pay, maybe to pay upon the condition of the house or whatever. But notice that the point, so when they put in a square footage of 200, uh, 2,800 square feet <clears throat> and multiply it times the slope and then add the y-intercept, they get 438,000. Notice that that point is right smack dab on the line and anything that they calculate will be on that line. The other points are not necessarily on that line, but anything that's calculated and predicted will be on that line. So that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, let me just show you a few things on the calculator. Let's see, I got the things in here actually. Now here's the, uh, You can use, we don't, um, most people don't think we're going to have access to mini tab. Um, when I was in school, because I mean, I was working in, in math and took statistics classes, used mini tab because it's specifically for statistics. But Excel is kind of the for everybody kind of thing. Most everybody's got access to Excel or a spreadsheet. They said Google Sheets does the same thing. Pretty much the commands are the same. But there's a, um, a function in Excel called correlation, and you have to just feed it the two different columns. Now, the same thing for the uh, TI-84, all right? And this is a kind of a pretty easy process because if you do this, and I'll show you how in a second, this is the screen that comes up and it gives you the um, slope and the y-intercept and then at the bottom, it gives you the correlation coefficient. So it gives you all three. All right. Now, the thing is, in order to do this, and I don't know why this doesn't come like this stock, but the first time, if you don't do, if you don't do this, you'll only get the correlation thing. You'll be missing... You'll be missing the uh, A and the B, which that doesn't give you the equation if you don't have that. You'll only see that bottom one. So what you got to do is do this diagnostic thing. And I'll go through this with you on the calculator to show you. But you got to hit second and zero, which is catalog. And then you go down, you got to scroll down quite a ways and you get to diagnostic on and you got to enter twice and that puts it on. And then after that, all of these will come out fine. So let's look at that. I'm going to actually go in and I think I already got these in on the calculator. <clears throat> but let's look at that. And that's what we end up with. I'm probably going to have to stop talking early because I'm starting to lose my voice. All right, so um, as I said, the first thing, make this a little bit bigger. The only way I know to do it is to take me out of the picture. All right, so 
Turn the thing on. Let's clear it out. So the first time you use it, it's second, and then you hit the zero, which is catalog. And then you got to go way down because they're in alphabetical order. You're going down to D. And there's diagnostic on and diagnostic off. By default, it'll be on off. So you got to hit enter twice. And then it'll say done. And then you go. You can go back now. Now let's, let's look at this. Um, Oops. If you go over to stat, this is where you're going to do everything. And this is the same place that you um, would have used it in chapter three. You got to put in the values, but you only put in, well, you did put in two columns there when you did the um, frequency distribution mean, but this right here where you do the descriptive statistics over here. That was where that was at. But anyway, let me just show you. I got these values for the house put in there. Those eight values. And uh, oops, I don't need to hit the second. So now we just hit stat and we go over to calc. And you go down to the fourth one. Like I said, yes, this will give you everything. But if you don't have that diagnostic thing on, you won't have the A and B. So there's your same equation. You got A is the slope and B is the y-intercept. All right. And then the regression, um, the correlation coefficient is the last one. R squared, I'm not, it's just simply R, uh, that same thing, the 0.9 times itself. I don't know where that, what that's useful for. There's probably something that I don't understand yet, but we don't ever use it. Just remember, it's the plain old R that's your correlation coefficient. Now, because it takes a long time to put all that in. Anyway, um, Let's see, what else can we do? Let's try to do a little um, Excel business, or not Excel, let's just do a little bit of uh, uh, we're gonna, um, what I'm going to do is use the uh, Spreadsheet. It's easier to show you the Google Sheets because I can open it in a window. But it's the same thing, and it works the same way as Excel. Let's see. I got to figure out how I can get those things over here. Well, I'm probably just going to type them in. Because I know some of y'all were using that to talk to me about it, so... <clears throat> Someone's going to type them in here. I can't really download them. Someone's going to.
3049. One of the things that uh, hopefully is changing about the way we teach this course at Delgado is he's getting away from having to do the calculations because most of these calculations are really, really a time intensive. And it's more important that you start to um, be able to understand what you're doing with them more than anything. But I mean, part of what we want to do is just to show you that these can be done because the homework problems are going to do with that. I'm going to have you ask you what these are. All right, so um, correlation, let's see. So you give it the one, and you give it the other, and there's your correlation coefficient. See how quick that is? Like I said, I think it's easier than doing a calculator. All right, let's see. Um, this one, of course, doesn't do the regression at the same time. Let's see. Hold on a second. I think it's real complicated on here. That's the problem. Um, on Excel, you can add your, um, what they call the statistics package. And that makes it real quick if you do it like that. I know there's a way. Oh, I, you know what? I think this is what you do it now that I remember. I remember now. All right, let's do the scatter plot. I'm pretty sure this is what you have to do. All right, so um, let's select both columns. This is kind of neat. It's a different way to do it than what Excel. Excel may do it like this. So you go over here and you pick. Um, Scatter plot. And somewhere on here, first of all, I just saw it and then I skipped past it. Hold on a second. Let me pause that just so it don't look like that'll be it. Okay, so what you got to do is go to the series, go down to um, checkbox there where it says trend line check that and then go down where it says label and then use equation like I said is then you got everything I was trying to move it but oh, we got it in there twice All right, so that's all the stuff for the course. And like I said, it is, uh, we've been flying along here. Y'all been such a good class. It's just uh, going by like a, I mean, extremely fast. Because, I mean, it's almost two months, but it doesn't quite seem like it. Like I said, I think they must have shortened things. Maybe it took a week out or something or a, a day, at least a day out. <clears throat> 